Um, hi, my name's Ivan Bartolo. This is a broken collarbone, if you're wondering. Now you can concentrate a bit more on what I'm going to say. <laughs> so um, I'll be talking about importing. One of my colleagues spoke about exporting. I'll talk about importing. Um, the first thing to say really is that if you import from a non-EU country, everything is going to stay more or less the same. The, the changes come if you are importing from an EU country. Um, at the moment, it's not even called importing if you're bringing um, seafood in from an EU country. You're just moving it around Europe. But that's going to become called importing, and all the government notices, they already have started to call it importing. Um, all the information we have uh, coming to us from government is about um, what happens in a no-deal situation. And like Hannah said, we don't know what will happen if there is some kind of deal. Um, but it's worth listening anyway to the no-deal situation because that gives an idea of what, what uh, direction the UK government wants to go. So I'll be talking about um, all these documents and procedures. Much of them are the same as, as what were mentioned previously. So catch certificates, health certificates, what happens with customs, uh, what's been said to be happening with tariffs and whatever trade agreements we have. Uh, so the first thing is the catch certificate. If you've been bringing uh, seafood in from Europe, you've not needed to have a catch certificate, so many people wouldn't have even seen a catch certificate until now. So I thought I'd just give some shots of some of the things that are on the catch certificate. This is the European catch certificate. It's uh, an import from South Korea. So the first bit shows you, gives you some details of the, the competent authority, so the equivalent of the MMO, of the Marine Management Organization over there, who's going to be stamping this. Um, there are the fields where the exporter has to fill in um, the name of the fishing vessel, uh, some details about what the consignment is. Uh, for example, frozen squid. You have to give the product code down there at the bottom. Um, that one over there, 030749. That gives an idea of the kind of uh, processes that the squid has undergone, if it's undergone any. And very importantly, the, the weight of, of the catch. And it's also good to remember that although it's called a catch certificate, um, Europe has a very special way of understanding what cash certificate means. You're actually certifying the consignment. So it is really uh, a document which says that that particular consignment is legal. And I'm saying this because it's important. It's not always relating to the whole catch that was caught by that vessel at that time. Um, and I'll mention that again later on. Um, so this bit... This is an important bit because this is the, the validation stamp of the competent authority of the flag state. So it was caught by a, southern, a South Korean vessel, and so it needs to have the stamp of the South Korean authorities, and that's what makes it um, a valid certificate, which means it, it, it can be used to import fish. Now... Some more details about the catch certificate. So they have to be original. This is all very old fashioned. You need to have a paper original catch certificate. When, um, when the U European IUU regulations were being made, they were quite adamant that it should be allowed that you could have electronic exchange of certificates. But this, uh, even though the intention is there and it's written, into the legislation. It doesn't really happen in practice. There are a few countries which have electronic cash certificates. I think Norway and Iceland do, and they're ex accepted over here. But in general, you're going to need the original paper certificate when you're importing the goods. And to make things a bit more complicated, it has to arrive with the consignment or presented before. Um, Port Health are the authorities in this country that will be um, checking the cash certificates. And they will detain the consignment until they're quite sure that they do have the cash certificate. They will be checking cash certificates on a risk basis. So um, you can say, what's the risk of a catch that's coming in from Europe? It should be quite low. But it's worth remembering that, for example, 
the United States aren't quite happy with catches from Italy. So they consider that some European countries are not quite up to speed with uh, IEU fishing. So who knows, maybe in the UK we'll start getting some, they might decide to detain some consignments and check the certificates a bit more carefully. This can happen. So what I'm saying is we can't just assume that because it's a European cash certificate it's going to be waived through. Um, also, you need to, uh, yeah, about having the original cash certificates presented straight away. Now, we've seen some, uh, some information that's been exchanged between Port Health, local authorities and the Port Health authorities. And they've been saying that they will accept an electronic cash certificate. Or they're, 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 they're saying that on occasion they will. So check with the port, because there's a chance that they'll say, OK, we will be happy to accept a fax or some, a copy sent in an advance if it's from Europe. Only if it's from Europe, of course. And then they'll let the consignment go through as long as you um, provide the catch certificate later. Um, so um, similar to what Hannah said, um, with imports, you might need the storage certificate and you might need the processing statement as well. Um, the processing statement has to be signed off by the competent authority in Europe. That's responsible for, for food health, usually. So I'm saying that it's not necessarily the same as the people that sign off the cash certificate, because that's the competent authority of the flag state who's responsible for the fishing side of things. If it's been processed, it needs to be signed off as well by the competent authority who's responsible for, for health and hygiene of, you know, the, the, the food health kind of thing. Um, uh, when, when you get the, when it's processed, it's acceptable to not have the original certificate, the original cash certificate. So usually those are copies that come along with, with, with processed food. So that's the uh, cash certificate side of things. Oh, no, stop. Some are exempt. So the cash certificate is, is, is there to check for illegally caught fish. So there are some that don't really fall into that category. So the, the European Union has decided, you know, we don't need to look for cash certificates if it's aquaculture, freshwater, most of the bivalve mollusks, and, and, and fish source. Um, that's, that's only part of the list. I think jellyfish are exempt as well. Cockles are picked from the beach rather than caught from a boat. Uh, so, so you really need to check with, with the regulation for the full list of, of things that are exempt. Um, so the main thing is aquaculture products. So if you're importing aquaculture products, if you're bringing bass and bream from Greece, you won't need any cash certificate at all. Um, We've heard, though, from Port Health, who will be checking the, the goods and the cash certificates, that if, if it looks like a fish that might not have been farmed, they will say, you know, if you're saying it's farmed, give me some evidence. So it's important to have some evidence with you if you bring in farmed fish, either on the labeling or on, on the commercial documents to say this is actually farmed fish, so that you won't be stopped at the border um, while you're expected to provide a cash certificate. Um, so I'll move on to health certificates now. <coughs> Imports from non-EU countries, that, that'll be the same as usual. Um, we've had the, the suppliers in these non-EU countries saying, can I still carry on produce using the same EU health certificates that we've always been using? And the answer is yes. Uh, you can imagine some of them were quite uncomfortable sending uh, uh, a EU cash certificate to the UK and it doesn't say it's a UK, I mean, sorry, health certificate, and it doesn't say it's a UK health certificate. But yes, the UK will carry on accepting EU style health certificates for the next six months. And then they'll look at it again. Um, the other change is that you can't use traces anymore. Traces is the European Commission's um, 
electronic system of, of registering imports for health authorities to be able to check them. Um, the UK has now developed um, its own system, which is called IPAFS, Import of Products, Animals, Food and Feed system. Um, so, so that you need to fill in all the boxes on that system um, if you're importing from a non-EU country. With EU countries, that's not going to, to be necessary at all. With EU countries, everything is going to be more or less the same as before, which is brilliant. So no health certificates. Um, it, they don't even need to go through a border inspection post. So stuff from the EU can carry on flowing in. In fact, it's only the catch certificate that can be the holdup with imports from the EU. Um, the health stuff is all absolutely fine. Um, there is an exception, and that is if you're importing goods from abroad through the EU. Um, if they have been cleared in the EU, as far as I understand, and I asked this question to the Food Standards Agency, if they've been cleared for C free circulation in the EU, then they can come in. So no health certificate, nothing else is needed. But if they haven't, then they will be checked. Um, and they would be treated as, as goods from non-EU countries. And um, direct landings. So you can get a situation where um, the fish is landed directly from an EU vessel straight into, into Scotland, into the UK. Um, the advice from the government was, what I put there in inverted commas, non-EU vessels will need to follow the same rules that will apply to UK registered vessels accessing an EU port. Um, so that means they need to be landed, they need to land into a designated port. And the DEFRA has a list of designated ports. And the, this is a selection of them over there. So Peterhead is, is the main one. P Peterhead is, is really big and um, has all the facilities, but the, the other ones over there as well will do it. They might have smaller windows, so they might only allow direct landings in the morning, for example. Basically, you need to check with them, and you will be checking with them because you need to pre-notify. So you need to send two emails. You need to send, um, I mean, it's not you. It's going to be this EU vessel that's going to have to do it. They'll need to send prior notification, four hours if it's fresh, 72 if it's frozen. Um, but it's unlikely to be frozen. And they need to email a pre-landing declaration as well. And these are all forms that are available on, on the, on the, on, uh, I don't think it's DEFRAS, I think it's the MMO's website. And it contains area of fish and the quantity of fish on board. <coughs> and now I'll move on to customs. A lot of this looks exactly like um, what Hannah showed before, especially the first five. But, um, Customs arrangements for goods coming into this country are going to be very similar to customs arrangements for that you know European countries will be will be using. So again, register for a EU EORI number. Um, so if you've been trading with the EU, you wouldn't have this. If you've been trading exclusively with the EU, so you need to get this. Um, find out the commodity code of your goods, and Seafish has um, advice on this on the Seafish website. You can find out the commodity of, uh, code. The commodity code is important because that defines exactly what kind of goods there are. There are commodity codes for absolutely everything you can imagine. There are commodity codes for, you know, silk pyjamas for boys, for example, that kind of thing. Every single thing, washing machine parts, every single thing you can imagine has got a commodity code associated to it, with it. And that then, against it, will be listed at... at a tariff, which will be the rate of duty you'll have to pay when you're importing it. So if you've been bringing stuff in from the EU, you probably haven't had to worry about commodity codes, but now you will. Um, you need to determine the value of your goods. Now, the value of your goods, it's usually quite straightforward. That is what you have to pay for them, and that will be on the commercial documents. But there might be complications. So you need to make sure that you know where you stand with the value. And that's important because you need to put that in the import declaration, and that will also determine the, the rate of the, the, the duty that you pay. 
You check whether it's restricted. This is only if you're importing things like eels and stuff on the, on the CITES list. Um, when we're talking about seafood, uh, establish the origin of the goods. This might be important if you can get some tariff breaks because of a deal with a particular country, for example. We have, a, we have a deal with Israel, for example. So if you're getting stuff from Israel, you have to prove that it's actually from Israel to benefit from, from this tariff break. Um, are you eligible for any facilitations? Now, there are lots of ways of not paying the full tariff, and people will be aware of these if they've been importing for a while. And this has to do with um, getting relief for various reasons. If you're importing under a quota system, for example, if you're importing to process and then re-export, for example, th there are ways of, of not having to pay uh, duty. And also maybe under this section comes um, the transitional simplified procedures. Now these are some new procedures that the government has introduced just recently specifically for goods that are coming in from the EU. So if you're importing from the EU and, and doing just roll-on, roll-off kind of trade, um, there are, there's an easier way of importing. Normally, you have to um, submit a full import declaration straight away with the when the goods come and pay your duty. And your goods won't be released until that's sorted until you have a declaration that customs are happy with and that you've actually paid your duty. But with this new simplified procedure, um, everything can be deferred. So your goods can come in, you can submit the import declaration later, and you don't have to pay your duty except later on on a monthly basis. So you keep a, a, a tally and then customs will keep a tally for you, I'm sure, and you have to pay for that. Um, so the other things are customs procedures, code, that has to do with filling in all the paperwork relating to, to what I said before. Um, you have to declare, that is the uh, import declaration. You have to pay duty and you have to keep records. So I mentioned paying duty. Now, on the 13th of March, the UK announced a whole set of new tariffs. I mean, until, until now, importers have been paying tariffs on stuff that comes from outside the EU. We don't pay tariffs on anything that comes from the EU using the EU standard tariff. Now, outside the EU, if there's no deal, then the UK will be able to set its own tariffs, its own rate of duty. I'll just skip to the next slide because this is actually the most important thing. What's not listed commands a 0% tariff. And I told you there are you know, many, many different kinds of commodity codes for, for I in the world, but for seafood there are about 300 or something like that. So you can see right over there, the ones that command tariffs are a, a small minority of the ones. So the, the thing with the new tariff is that most stuff is going to be 0% tariff, 0% duty, and I'll talk about that on that slide. Um, I'll just go through a few of these which will have tariffs. Um, things like frozen fish not elsewhere specified. Now most of the fish is actually elsewhere specified in the tariff. So cod, haddock, coli, pollock, all these things. Um, you know, all the pelagic fish that we all know the names of, all the stuff that we fish around our coasts. Those are all named and those are all zero tariffed. So when we, saw, when we talk about importing frozen fish, not elsewhere specified, we're talking about some quite exotic kind of species. We're talking about, I don't know, snapper, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the same if it's filleted, um, same with frozen meat. Um, oh, no, frozen meat is specifically of monkfish, so monkfish will be tariffed if we bring it into this country. Um, there's all the warm water shrimps over there that will be tariffed, uh, that will, will command a tariff. Um, frozen crustaceans, that excludes just about all the crustaceans I know of, so I don't know what that's going to be applied to, that 12%. And two knives, 24%, that's always been high historically, so it will stay there. 
and various trout products. This is not a complete list. There are a couple of freshwater things I left out of the list. So as I said, it's going to be mainly 0% for import in terms of tariffs. It doesn't mean you don't have to submit an import declaration. You still have to submit all the paperwork, but it's going to be zero. And as I said, it's all this stuff. Cold water shrimps as well. Most of the preserved and prepared shrimps, those that come under customs code 1604, I think it is. Lobsters and scallops, um, these are all zero. Uh, some other stuff about tariffs and about GSP. Um, GSP is the generalized system of preferences. Um, so if we import from developing countries, the EU has a system where we basically give them a break and they either get a very low tariff or 0% tariff. So, you know, for years and years we've been importing warm water prawns from India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, you know, all those countries on 0% on tariff or a very low percent tariff. And this is all about, you know, helping developing countries develop their, their own trade. Um, outside of the EU, the UK could have said we're going to ignore that. But no, they said we're going to carry on with this system. So whatever you do now, if you import from outside the EU, these are all non-EU countries, and you, you're benefiting from this, this duty break, the, the GSP, then that will carry on into the future. Um, trade agreements. Trade agreements are important because, again, if you've got a trade agreement, there's usually a lower tariff involved somewhere. So the UK has announced it's already signed trade agreements with all these countries. Now, I've highlighted the ones that are really important for fish, so Faroe Islands, obviously. So we've signed a trade agreement with them. How important is this now that we saw the UK tariff? I'm not so sure because what we get from the Faroes is mostly whitefish, frozen whitefish. And that's going to be 0% tariffed anyway. So having a trade agreement, I don't know. Maybe it's because it works both ways. Um, Chile, Switzerland, all, all those other countries. Um, Liam Fox has said he wants to have trade agreements signed with about 40 countries or blocks in all. So there's still some way to go. Just at the end of last week, it was announced that, again, Norway and Iceland, we're close to having completed trade agreements with that. When, when they announce that, you know, we've signed a trade agreement, sometimes you've really got to be careful because they tend to announce it very, very early when there are just a few signatures left. And sometimes those last few details can take months. So we'll see how soon uh, this Norway and Iceland get sorted. Um, and the UK is working on a number of other arrangements as well. And they're still hopeful that they'll all be ready um, before, before we leave the EU. Uh, one little thing about quotas. Now, lots of um, processes depend very much on quotas to be able to import tariff-free. A lot of people depend on those autonomous tariff quotas, the ATQs. Now, again, a lot of these ATQs um, they've got to do with cod and haddock and whitefish and to a certain extent pelagic fish and they're all going to be zero tariffed if there's no deal. So there's not really much need for these ATQs anymore. Um, with uh, warm water shrimp, it's a bit different. There are some quotas for that uh, because you can't always import it um, using the GSP and even with GSP you might be paying a small amount of tax so maybe 4.5 percent tax uh, duty so <laughs> these were quite important for for warm water shrimp in fact some some people might get hit with the with the with with this new development because if you import from I don't know Vietnam and process in Holland then the origin of that shrimp will change and it will change from Vietnam to Holland. So all of a sudden, you might have to pay whatever, you know, you might have to pay the full rate of duty because it's not covered by GSP anymore. And warm water shrimps actually did have a tariff associated with them. So that might be a change. Um, there are other tariffs that are not 
autonomous tariff quotas, they're smaller in volume, but obviously people use them. They are, after all, practically zero. I think most of them are zero percent duty. Um, and legislation is being prepared to, to uh, set them up and to, to lay out exactly how, how they're going to be managed. They're going to be on a first-come, first-serve basis, but obviously there needs to be legislation to explain exactly how that's going to work. So that's a bit about quotas. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, about the information that we have. Most of what I said and more is available on the, on the Seafish website. So basically, you need to go there and look for it, and it will be there. And we're keeping it up to date as well as things develop. So this is what the Seafish website looks like. This is an example of one of the news items that we had very recently that Hannah wrote about catch catch and health certificates. Um, we have the import and export pages on the regulation bit of the website. We have the Seafish guidance, which has been receiving loads of hits, and again, which we keep updating all the time. You can see it's been updated quite recently there, 22nd of March. And apart from that, we there's other stuff. There's um, Arena will be talking to you tomorrow about tariffs again and import and export numbers and market insights. And also something really useful is to sign up to our newsletters. There are, this, you need, I can't sign you up, you need to go yourself to this page over here. And towards the bottom over there, there are all the different newsletters that we produce and they include um, uh, the legislation newsletter which comes out once a month and we also have EU exit newsletters, which come out about once a week, sometimes even more often. So it's worth going there. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>